Good morning, good morning, good to see you here today. Looks like you're having a good day, <clears throat> and it looks like a good Sunday school attendance this morning. All right, well, we welcome you to the Joy class. Hello to anyone that's uh, watching online. We say also to you, say hello back to us online if you don't mind, please. Okay, well, it's a nice, cool morning. What a blessing it is to be here. Uh, good to see Tom back there. You doing okay, Tom? All right, okay, great. Our verse today, it, I'm going to use one that has the word gladness in it. Uh, we talk about joy, but there's a verse in our text today in Philippians 2 that says, Receive him in the Lord with all gladness. And it's talking about receiving one of the workers that's coming back, and we'll get into that in our lesson. But it says, Receive him in the Lord with all gladness. And you know what? There's gladness, and then there's gladness in the Lord. And there, there's a difference, isn't there? Uh, you know, you can, have a, you can have an entirely secular birthday party, nothing wrong with that, but you can also include the Lord in it, can't you? And things like that. So, a good way to do it. All right. We do have a new uh, prayer list this morning. Hope you got one of those. Anyone need a prayer list? Uh, they are absolutely, teetotally free. Anyone need one? Okay, that's all we're giving away, though, that's free today. Everything else is going to cost you. All right, a prayer list, and it has our birthdays on there, uh, thankfully, also. So let's, uh, let's, let's do a little bit of talking here, and I'm going to ask you to be involved in something here in just a minute. But uh, let, me, let me, I have four things that we need to talk about. First of all, next Sunday... What's going on next Sunday after church? Yeah, we're going to have a, a joy class Thanksgiving meal, and I hope you can come. I hope you, you can do that. If you haven't signed up, sign up today. Uh, probably today is, uh, we need to know for the number-wise, but we have a number of people. Uh, Ruth, do you have the list, or where is it? It's okay. But uh, she'll be up here because we got a list that we need to attend to here in a minute as well that I will tell you about. So sign up for that, and, and um, we would just love for you to be here. And then I hope you know, but if not, let me just tell you that Mrs. Shirley Lunsford uh, passed away just the other day. I'll read just a couple of, of the uh, sentences in our obit. Mrs. Shirley Jean Boffman Lunsford, age 84, beloved wife of 69 years to Mr. Alvin E. Lunsford, went home to be with the Lord on Friday, November 5th, at her home. And then it mentions about her daughter, Myra. Some of you know Myra Bussell and her husband, Tommy. And then their son, Vernon, and his wife, Susan. So we have a benefit in the joy class that, you know, when you're a member and you, it could be you or your spouse or a child or your parent, uh, someone close like that, we... We like to do a meal for the family on the day of the funeral. And so can we do that for the Lunsfords? You know, they've been such a blessing to us as a, in the church and in the joy class. So that's what we would like to do. Now, sometimes we've, we've leaned very heavily upon the Glovers, but the funeral is this Tuesday, and the barbecue barn isn't open yet, you know, that early in the week. So it, it really comes to us. So let's pull together, Joy Class, and see what we can do to have enough food for them. We're looking at about 30 to 40 people in the family, unless we hear otherwise before that time. But that was the number that Brother Alvin thought would be there. So what we're going to ask you to do, if you can help with a dish, and we've got two sign-up lists up here, and we need to kind of fill them up. Ann's already um, signed up for something, but we've got... The dish, whether it's a meat or vegetable, over on this side, and a few ladies should just come up, and uh, they're too identical because it's not an overlap. We need that much. So uh, I'm just going to ask if you can do that. Ladies, if you can help, um, just come on up here and sign that, and while you're signing it, I'll do some talking. So if you can come, if you can do it, here we are. <laughs> here it is. So uh, come on up and just uh, fill Put your name, if you have anything to, you know, to talk about, tell Ruth about that and she'll take care of, of all of that. But just, yeah, just come on up. That's, we appreciate that so much. Now the time of the, 
visitation is this Tuesday at 11 o'clock, and that goes until the funeral, which will be at 1 o'clock, and then the burial. So we're, we're having the meal over here about 3, 3 or 3.30 in the, after the burial, and therefore, what time do you need to bring the food? About noon would be perfect. That way, if we could get it either over to the gym or on the back counter back here, that would be good. If you can't do that, just let Ruth know what your plan is, and she'll make note of that. So thank you so much for that. Uh, thank you, ladies. We will do all that we can. And if Joy Class, if we have to buy some food, we, we will do that. I know this about Brother Alvin. Uh, his main thing is he loves vegetables. We went out to eat with him one time. There used to be a buffet on Gordon Highway, and, and we went over there, and Brother, he just loves vegetables. So anyway, you ladies throw a little extra something, to, you know, that country cooking, if you do a vegetable, because he is tuned in to that. Thank you so much for what you do, and if you don't know right now and you can help later, that would be wonderful also. All right, then let's see. You have responded so well to the Callaway Gardens. I think we have about 39 folks, and I think they're taking the bus and the van. That's my understanding, so there will be plenty of room. But I need to get your deposit if you have that today. You can bring it this evening. And if you don't have it, uh, just let me know, you know, that you're definitely planning to come. You can bring it. We'd like to have it today, though, if possible. And then if you say, well, you know, I think I can go on the trip, then, hey, just put your name down. And uh, you're in. You'll be in. Happy for you to go. That's Callaway. When is that? November the 29th and 30th. Monday and Tuesday. Where are you going? To Callaway Gardens. What I understand is a beautiful place. Uh, I went online and I saw the lights. Have you ever seen the Christmas light fight show? You ever seen that on TV? Well, one thing they have is they have, it's like a field. You know, you see the ornaments like in Charleston and other places where they'll have, you know, a Santa Claus or some uh, poinsettias lit in lights. But they've got this thing, it's like a field of lights and it's computer control. And these lights are all in syncopation. And then they've got this huge thing. It looks like a tree. And those lights look like they're running up the tree and all that. So it's going to be a, a beautiful, beautiful display of lights. And then you'll, your, your price is $312.24. That's for two people. That's your room. That's for the breakfast. That's for your tickets, your gratuity, your tax, your gas tax, your, you know, your methane tax, all that. You know, so... Anyway, that includes everything. So everything that is as far as what, you know, the, the group uh, program is. You need to bring some money for a meal on the Monday and then coming back probably a lunch, I would assume, as well. So you kind of figure that. Just, just pad your, your pocket a little bit. That'll be good. And uh, I'm sure we have some people that, you know, they're giving away money. They'll help you out. All right. Well, thank you, ladies. Thank you so much for that. That looks pretty good. We'll continue to work on that. And uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Do you have yes, if you could bring it about. See, the visitation is 11 to 1, and Ruth will be over there at least by 12. So you could take it to the gym about 12. Or if, if you just come in and you want to put it on the back counter, back here in the back, that would be fine too. Thank you. Good question. Any other question? All right. So see me if you have your deposit today. I'm doing that for Jody. They couldn't be here today, so we are doing that. One other thing that uh, I will mention today, and that is uh, she's on the prayer list, but it's Helen Bailey. Helen <coughs> Bailey is as faithful a lady as I, I know. You know, for many, many years, she worked in our Awana uh, program, and you'll see her coming in sometimes pushing the wheelchair with Toby Reese. She's, her sister was married to Toby, and of course she'd lived with her sister and Elizabeth and them for years, and she still does. Well, for about 10 years, she's uh, been with stage four of uh, kidney failure. 
And they told her eventually it was going to get worse and dialysis is in your future. So it's here and she's coming home from the hospital on Monday and she's going to need to be taken to dialysis three times a week. She lives in North Augusta, right off of Georgia Avenue. The place where the dialysis is, is at, right across from the barbecue barn. It's only about a two and a half mile distance. And I believe this, for myself, and I think you would agree, family first is to take care of our loved ones. But sometimes, you know, there's a need for us to kind of pitch in and help. Family may not be able to do everything. And so they have asked that if we could help them some on that, because they also, Elizabeth and Toby, they have doctor's appointments and so forth. So I was just thinking, and this is my thoughts, maybe if we had somebody that we could, we could just say, we'll do a day a week. And that is, you would pick her up, drop her off at the dialysis place, and um, several hours later, she would be ready to come home. And we could do that, pick her up and take her home one day. Or it may be that the mornings are bad for them and we could pick them up, pick her up one morning and somebody, and then the family picks her up in the afternoon. We pick her up another morning and the family picks her up the rest of the time. But anyway, if you want to help with that and you know Helen, that would be a blessing. And uh, that goes along with our Sunday school lesson today. And again, I know, hey, I know I'm looking at busy people. You're looking at a busy person too. And I realize that, but sometimes, you know, we say, well, I'm busy, but I think I can work a little more in. And that's what we're asking you to consider doing. Just help out. And I think, you know, let's do this for the end of the year, the rest of the year, and then we'll look at things and see how it is. Yes, no, she, she's mobile. Uh, she may be on a, she may have to use a walker now. Um, but I, I think, well, I know that's the way she would be going uh, with, with her niece, who is Elizabeth. So good question. Any other thought or question on that? And again, she's in North Augusta. If you know where the Bojangles is, uh, they're on North Augusta, Georgia Avenue. She lives back in one of the neighborhoods, just dropping her off over by the barbecue barn. <clears throat> so thank you with that. Thank you for prayerful consideration for that. And uh, we just want to be a help. Again, we can't do everything. All right, who has a birthday today? Let's see, November 1st, we mentioned Terry last week, and good for that. Larry Whittle, Leon Whitt uh, Waters, and our birthday man today is Jerry Hall. How about that? All right. He uh, had two candles on his cake. One was a five and one was a seven. And he was looking for these. This is according to Jerry now. He was looking for where those candles are. And he said to someone, I needed a five and a seven, seven and a five. And they said, well, they're right over there. And, and he said, well, which do you think I am, the five, seven or the seven, five? And they, I don't know if they were selling insurance or what, but they told him, they told him five, seven. <laughs> oh, your height. <laughs> Okay, okay. Well, anyway, but happy birthday. We're, we're happy for you. You know, it almost seems to me that, is there another birthday on today, somebody else? I saw a list, and I thought for sure I saw two birthdays on the 7th. Anyone, anyone else? Okay, all right. But what a happy time that is. Okay for our prayer list. Our prayer list. Continue to remember Pastor Tad, Amy, and Tyler. Brother Zach and Miss Tony, and I hope, you know, we may see Miss Tony here today. That's the plan. And what a blessing. Continue to remember Josh and Amy Durden as they seek the Lord's will, Jared Gefeller, Richard Adams. Continue to remember Debbie's husband, Richard, Carol, Jean Ballhorn, Helen Bailey, as we've mentioned, John's dad, John Bancroft Sr., Johnny Bates. Thankfully, he's here today. Steve Bell came home, and he thanks you for, his, for your prayers. He's doing better. He, the VA treated him very well. They helped him a lot. Continue to remember the Berensons, Debbie Brown, Joe Brown. Joe is on his way to Columbia. He's having an MRI concerning the surgery to correct the eye 
that happened somewhat after uh, Mary's passing, it's just kind of a wandering eye, and he'll need surgery, but he has to get some tests done today in Columbia, and that's where he is. Continue to remember Joanne Corley, Lori Dyson, see Mike here, so continue to remember her for migraines and the eye surgery she had. Audrey Finley, we spoke with her, and uh, she's about the same. Joel Galt, Sandy Hall having a, is it the MRI and shot? Which, So she's having an injection Wednesday, and these can be quite painful, so pray for Sandy in regard to that. Pray for uh, Jimmy and Dottie Hawk battling uh, Dottie, especially foot uh, infection. Jimmy waiting the possible uh, surgery. For the Glovers, uh, Susan's dad, Dewey Henderson. Pray for Candy, Candy Holler. The Howells, Brother Al, especially in the passing of Shirley. Reverend Charlie Marshall, Pastor Tad is trying to go up each week. <clears throat> He's kind of on that downhill slide. He stays in bed most of the time. So uh, pray for Brother Charlie, if you will, please. Then Pat Robertson, John L., good to see John L. back here. Trish and Rose Wilson and, and her sons, Russell Young. Can we do it again, unspoken request? I have them. I sure do. Widows and widowers, we love you. And then our impact class member project. So we have Shirley Lunsford there under the Harbor Chase, but actually her dress changed. Uh, Brother Al said, he said, she so wanted to be healed and come back to church. And we were talking and, and we said, well, she was healed. She just didn't get to come back to church. But you know, she's having church, but she's having better church, isn't she? Margie Berry, Jean Black, um, he's kind of low. Cheryl Durden, just uh, lots of pain. Wendy Olson, Gerald Owen, good to have Brother Gerald here. Mildred Owen, Sandra, Sandra, Sanders, Miss Ethel Sparks, The Waters, Vivian Williams, B. Willis. Nana's, we'll mention Nana's sister in Korea. And then uh, Susan Mara's sisters, and Darlene and Mike. The boat rights ask what, that we remember them. And then Brenda Holtzclaw, uh, Larry's sister. She's, she's been uh, very critical. She had two surgeries, and now she's had a third surgery. So uh, just really having a hard time, Brenda Holtzclaw. Sue Boatwright asked that we remember her good friend and former, former boss, Gwen Ashley. She had a massive heart attack and is in ICU at Aiken Hospital. Many requests, but it's the first of the month, and so we like to go over all of them. But uh, many things to pray for. <clears throat> but we have a big God. And we that are Christians, you can come on up, Brother Ted's going to lead us in prayer. We as Christians, you know, God's not far away. His Holy Spirit lives within us. And that's a blessing, isn't it, that God lives within us. Good morning, class. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, this joy class is special, but Lakeside is also special. And, and, and I believe it's special because every group in this church prays fervently to you for any problem we have. Uh, people in our joy class are hurting, dear Father. And, and we pray that, that you will touch their lives. And, and, and as we watch these miracles in our church, like, like uh, Brother Zach and Tony and, and Walter and Stephanie, and, and we, we mm -hmm. sometimes forget, dear Father, that their families are affected greatly by, by what's happening. And, and we ask, dear Father, that you will give them grace and, and help them to to uh, go through their daily lives. Uh, we all think we have time, we have time. But dear Father, we never know what time we have. So let us, I pray that we'll be urgent in what we do, how we live our lives, what we say to other people, uh, help us to emulate you. We ask all these things, dear Father, in your name. Amen. Thank you. All right. Well, we've had a lot of announcements. Amen. 
I kind of feel like, you know, the cat in the room full of rocking chairs that, uh, with all these details to go over. But bear with us, okay? Are you okay with all that? Sometimes we have to talk about things, you know, but, but they're important. You know, they really are. Good to see Ken and Miss Josephine over there and Linda Faye. All right. There are long-distance folks over there, but uh, that's okay. That's all right. They can hear. All right, we'll turn to Philippians chapter 2. And there's Miss Peggy over there. She came in the other way. It's not your birthday, is it, Peggy? Okay, all right, okay. She's starting on her next birthday, so that's a good thing, too. <clears throat> but if you can, be a blessing to the Lunsfords. Uh, and uh, if you don't work or whatever, maybe you can be here for Tuesday for the service. Pastor Tad will be doing the service. It is here. I didn't mention that, but uh, the visitation and the service is here. Our lesson title is Two Outstanding Men of God, <clears throat> and the verses are chapter 2, verses 19 through 30. Our key verse, though, the Sunday school lesson gave us, it's a wonderful one. It's Mark 10, 45. For the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. So anytime, you know, we're, we're serving one another, uh, let's remember the Lord did that for us. And he said he didn't come to be ministered unto. He didn't come to be served. He came to serve. What a, what a statement. Well, let's read a couple of verses and then make a few comments here. So in verse 19, uh, the Apostle Paul says, But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timotheus shortly unto you, that I may <clears throat> also may be of good comfort when I know your state. Then if you'll look down in verse 25. Yet I supposed it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and companion in labor, and fellow soldier, but your messenger and he that ministered to my wants. So we have three people here. We have the Apostle Paul, we have Timothy, and we have Epaphroditus. You know, in the Old Testament, it's different. You know, there was the Old Testament time when the Bible says that they, when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God. You know, they forgot God. And so, you know, God, uh, there was Adam and Eve, and then the, the, the descendants of Adam and Eve, they became so bad, God said their, their, all of their thoughts were bad. So there was a flood. And then in Noah's time, there were the three uh, sons of Noah, and the world was populated again, and you know what happened? They became prosperous, and they forgot God. And so God says, well, I'm going to take a man, Abraham, and I'm going to start a nation from him, and I'll send prophets to them, and I will, I will, I will teach them, and I will show them. And that's what the Old Testament is. It's so much about Israel. And so they were a blood-united people, by blood, by birth. But you know, in the church age... It's not by blood, is it? Because Paul in this, these, this trio of people, Paul was a full-blood Jew. Didn't matter. Timothy, his mother was a Jew, but his father was a Greek. So he was half Jew. It didn't matter. And then Epaphroditus, he wasn't Jewish at all. It didn't matter. And so in the church age, you know, it's not by our blood birth, but it's by our spiritual birth. And God had, you know, he had said in the Old Testament that he would be merciful. He'd raise up a branch uh, from the line of Jesse and the, the Gentiles would trust in him. That's who we are today. The only Jew is pr probably back here and, and that's Brother Earl Mackey, but it doesn't matter. So, you know, this group. But in the church, <clears throat> 1 Timothy 3.15 says that the, this is called the church of the living God the pillar and ground of the truth. The church is called the house of God. And you know, in a house, there has to be certain things set up for leadership and rule. So the Lord has established leaders in the church, right? The two offices in the church are pastor and deacons. Now, the pastor is also called an elder and he's a bishop, but it's the same person. It just describes his position in a little different way. But, it, but in addition to a pastor and deacons, 
There are also other people that serve and God has given them gifts. If you read Romans 12, you see they are generally divided up in speaking gifts and serving gifts. Hey, uh, speaking gifts, that's what I've, I'm doing. That's what Larry's done, Brother uh, Bobby has done, and others. Glenn's taught before Sunday school. But then there's the serving gifts. This is, this is part of the serving gifts. It's helping one another. And uh, Romans 12 explains, you know, they're even if involving giving, our giving. So what I'm getting at is there are, there are people that are needed to serve one another in the church, and the Lord set that up. The church is not Pastor Tad's or all the staff. It's the Lord's church, and he calls whom he will, and he puts them to care for the church. And so we're going to get a little bit of a window looking in in God's viewpoint of his servants working to be a blessing to the people that God loves. You know, God didn't call me or Brother Bobby for our sake. He called us and he called Pastor Tad, and Brother Wes, and Brother Zach, and Brother Jake. He call, called us because he loved his people and he wanted us to serve his people and to teach and to be a blessing. So let's look at this lesson in these two outstanding man, men. And uh, it, just notice a verse that I think uh, is, is good to keep in mind about them. And that is in verse 29 where it says, Hold such in reputation. Hold such in reputation. And that is people like Alvin Lunsford and other people that have served the Lord. You know, uh, cherish their reputation. Don't forget about what they have done. But don't, uh, hey, don't forget what the Lord Jesus has done. Nobody can ever serve so much that we can say, oh me, whenever we realize that Jesus did not come to be served. He came to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. All right, so let's look at Timothy. First of all, Timothy put the things of Christ before himself. So let's see how he was faithful to the church, how he was faithful to Christ, and how he was faithful to Paul. So how was he faithful to the church? Let's look in verse 19. So Paul says, But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy or Timotheus shortly unto you that I may be of good comfort when I know your state. He says, For I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. How was he faithful to the church? Well, Paul is saying that he would naturally care for them. But you know, I see something here, and this to me in this lesson has been kind of a main thing that I have learned from this. Notice how Paul puts it in verse 19. But I trust in the Lord, uh, in the Lord Jesus, to send Timothy. And then he says, um, um, he says at the end of verse 19, when I, uh, he says, when I know your state, that I may be good comfort when I know your state. What I see is Paul, even though he was an apostle, he had to go day by day trusting the Lord. He didn't know everything that was going on. He didn't know what all was going on in there at the city of Philippians. You know what else he didn't know? He did not know what was going to happen to him. And so in, in this matter of sen sending Timothy, it's a matter of trusting the Lord. But you know why the, you know, the Lord is um, wanting Timothy to go? Because he wanted the people to be cared for. And Paul wanted to know their state. You know, um, Pastor Tad is always interested in our state. When it says that I may know your state, we have a state of the union address. You know what the word state means? It doesn't mean like state is a body or a political thing, but the word state has the idea of surroundings, the things that are going on around you, your state. And so Paul is saying, you know, I want to send Timothy so I can be, I'm going to be assured that everything is okay. I want to know what's going on in the city of, of Philippi. And so, um, and by the way, if you have problems, tell someone. Don't just suffer, you know, in your uh, spiritual life alone. You have people that are interested, Pastor Tad, others that would, would help you and their wives would help you. And Paul was saying, you know, I, I want to know and be assured that everything is okay. And why Timothy? He says, 
in verse 20, he says, I have no man like-minded, means one soul. He and Paul were one soul who will naturally care for you. The idea of naturally means of sincerity. He was, it wouldn't be forced. If Timothy shows up, if Timothy came today and, and on, he was speaking at our church, he would speak, but he'd also be talking to people. You know, what, what's going on? You know, do you, do you have problems? How can we help you? You know, here's what God says about your problem. Timothy would naturally care for them. And so here's a man that's putting um, the things of the Lord first. And then not only was he faithful to the church, he was faithful to Christ. Verse 21 says, For all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ. And so I thought I would ask you, when it says, they, For all seek their own, I thought I would just ask you this. All people seek their own what? What is it that people seek when it says they seek their own? Anybody have any ideas? Huh? Okay, their own way. It's good. For all seek their own, their own and not the things of Christ. Recognition. Recognition, that's absolutely the way, the recognition. What else? Comfort. Comfort. What else? Your own people. Yeah, that's true too. Uh, well, their own will, no, that's, that's different. Uh, comfort, I think comfort's a lot, you know, possessions are a lot, positions a lot, you know, they, it's just normal. People, you know, we think about what others have, you know, and we'll seek those things for ourselves. And, and it's not that all of that is bad, but what Paul is saying is, I can send Timothy because he's not just interested in his own comfort. He will, he'll be willing to go because it wouldn't be comfortable to travel. He was, if he was with Paul in Rome, it would not be comfortable for him to make that trip to Philippi. That would be a toil, and that would involve some danger. And there would just be a lot of people who said, No, Paul, hey, don't ask me that. I, I just can't do that. I just don't want to do that. Or I don't want to, you know, I don't want to leave my business. It's growing and growing. And Paul says, Well, you know, somebody needs to go. But Timothy would. Timothy would. And so here's, he was faithful to Christ. He put the things of Christ before his own. And that's what the Lord Jesus did. Now, I realize, you know, we all have our calling and God doesn't ask you to do something ridiculous. You know, I don't think God is asking anybody to sell your house and give it all and you to become a homeless person. You know, I just, when I first got saved, I didn't know if that was what, you know, God asked people to do, but no, he doesn't. But he does ask us to serve and he may ask somebody to do that, but that's not normally what he does. But he was also faithful to Paul. And Paul says that about Timothy. Notice, he says in verse 22, you know the proof of him. The idea of proof is something like testing metal. You know, you test it, you see how it would have been, maybe you put it, a torch on it, you test it, you prove it. And what does Paul say? You know Timothy. He's been through a lot of tests, and he's been proven. And Paul says, I can send him. You know the proof of him. How has he helped Paul? Verse 22, he said, as a son with the father, he served with me in the gospel. You know, as a son, he wasn't the physical son of Paul, but he was maybe the convert of Paul. But can you see the picture of Paul and Timothy just walking along those trails together, those cities from city to city? But they're like father and son. Timothy loves Paul. Paul loves Timothy. They're not trying to outdo any, each other. I don't think Paul was a critic, you know, of Timothy, and certainly Timothy was not a critic of Paul. They were, they were working together. We saw a program the other day, and it was one of the reality things, and we just noticed how the bickering between the father and the son, and it's so counterproductive when we bicker with people, you know, and cut down and put down, and then it goes back to the other one, putting the other one down, and it was just like, you know, that's so unnecessary. And so the father and son needs to be kind of described as this, as working together. And I say that to you as a parent or a grandparent, you know, to be, to be what we need to be as fathers to our sons. And I say that to myself as well. And then he says uh, in verse 22 also, served with me in the gospel. And uh, we don't have a whole lot of time, but, you know, we could spend a lot of time in that phrase, in the gospel. There's a lot of things that go on in the church 
or churches today that's not really in the gospel. You know that? In the gospel means that Paul and Timothy, the main thing they were doing, man, is they were taking the word of God and they were going to places and they were giving out the word of God. And they weren't just teaching the Ten Commandments. They were teaching people about the Lord Jesus. The gospel means the good news of Christ. And, so, and they were not just teaching the dietary laws of the Old Testament, be that as good as they may be. And as, as they talk about you know, taking money and receiving money, the main thing they wanted their money to go for was in the gospel. You got that? You know, that's, that's the important part. It's what we do with the gospel, you know, trying to get the gospel out. Pastor Tad said, I never heard him say it, but said Lee Robertson used to say, on with the gospel and hang the cost. Well, we'd say, whoa, you know, uh, it, it may cost a lot, but that was his attitude. On with the gospel and hang the cost. In other words, we'll, we'll provide, but uh, the gospel comes first in the gospel. Uh, Brother Larry spoke at the prayer meeting yesterday, and he was talking about how at Lakeside, you know, we've been, a, we've been a King James church, but we've also been a missions church. Why? We need to be serving in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's so important to God, and then it's so useful for us to keep after what God is interesting. So he was faithful to Paul, and he served. And uh, just notice... Um, a few things about Paul's feelings about this. Verse 23 and 24. Therefore, him therefore I hope to send presently so soon as I shall see how it will go with me. But I trust in the Lord that I also myself shall come shortly. And you know what I see of this? I see Paul in the prison. And he's being told, you know, certain things about a trial and, you know, they may put you to death. And, but he's praying and he's asking God that he might be able to go and visit these churches again. But you know, I see where he says, I hope to send presently so soon as I see how it will go with me. Now remember those words as how it will go with me. You know, sometimes God doesn't tell us everything that's going to happen to us in our lives. But you know what we can do? is just keep trusting the Lord day by day by day, as Mr. Berenson said. Even Paul, you say, uh, Paul, didn't you know for sure that you were going to be delivered and that you wouldn't have to face that uh, trial? And No, he did not know that. He was praying for that. And there will be another instance, too, where we just have to walk by faith. And so that's, and, and, uh, that's how Paul was, was treating that. A couple of lessons I just thought would be helpful as we, before we move on. Number one is that the church does need care. It needs, over, it needs a shepherd over it. Now, the Lord Jesus is the chief shepherd, and Pastor Tad is the shepherd unto him. And God put a church together, and he put leaders over it because it needs leaders. If you don't have a leader, you're going to have half going this way and the other half divided up into 50 ways going that way. So you need leadership. But also, it takes leaders that are unselfish like Timothy. You know, we don't just, you know, pay a person to get up and preach for us. We pay a person so that he can be free to do what God has called him to do, which involves taking care of the flock and preaching and praying. But we don't pay him just to get up to preach. We just provide for his needs so that he is free to do that. He doesn't have to work at Kimberly Clark and come rushing in in the evening and you know be here every other Sunday or something like that but, so he can be free. But you don't pay a man to serve God, do you? No, you don't. But, but it does take an unselfish person to do all the work in the ministry. And then the lesson that Paul certainly had uncertainties. He was not, he was not the big boss over what happened to him. <clears throat> I was listening to the radio and I heard Erwin Lutzer. <clears throat> he's on a, the Christian radio station. He said he got on an airplane one time and he's the pastor of Moody Church, a big church there in Chicago, and a lot of people knew him. So they said, oh, we're so glad that uh, brother, Pastor Lutzer is on the plane today. If we have any turbulence, we know that he can get it fixed because he's got connections. You know, he's a pastor. And uh, Erwin Lutzer said to him, he says, no. He said, uh, he said, 
You know, I, I can't do that. I can't, I can't fix it if we, if we get turbulence. He said, he said, I'm in sales, not management. <laughs> it's pretty good. And that's true. The preacher's, you know, he's, he's, he's telling, but he's not the big boss, you know. And, uh, but that was pretty good, I thought. And so that's the way Paul was. He was waiting for the outcome and trusting God. Do you have anything like that going on in your life and you don't know and you're concerned about and you're a little worried about? Paul was that way. Things we don't know how they're going to work out. But we're to trust the Lord. He, he used the word, I hope. And, uh, you know, it's good to have a positive outlook and not be saying, well, I can't do this and I can't do that. And I'm afraid of this. What time I'm afraid... I will pray, the Bible says. So let's do that as well. So anyway, the uncertainties. Now let's look at Epaphroditus. He also put the things of the Lord before himself. His name meant lovely or charming, and he proved to be a man like that. First of all, consider his credentials there in verse 25. Paul says, Yet I suppose it necessary or needful to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and companion, and labor and fellow soldier, but your messenger... And he that ministered to my wants. What was he to Paul? He was a brother. You know, I see Joe and, uh, and Jim Brown. And, you know, they're brothers and they love one another. Jim went to be with Joe today and going to Columbia just to be with him. He's a brother. I don't have a brother, you know, but uh, brothers can be close and they can be helpful. And Paul said, Epaphroditus is a brother. I love him. I trust him. But also he was a companion in labor. <clears throat> And this man, Epaphroditus, he had come from Philippi to Rome to be with, with Paul. But he was a worker there. And I can imagine Paul said, Epaphroditus, you know, I can't leave this prison cell. But there is a family over here that I have witnessed to. I want you to go over there. And so he was sent over there. And maybe Epaphroditus, you know, in those prisons, you had to have family to bring you food. They did not provide food for you. They did not provide clothing for you. And Epaphroditus may have said to somebody, hey, does anybody have an extra coat that I can give Paul? <clears throat> does anyone have a little extra food that you can prepare <clears throat> that I can give Paul? So he was a companion in labor, but he was also a fellow soldier. That means, they've been, that means they had been in a lot of conflicts together, and they were standing for Christ together. I was never in the military. Some of you were. And you know, if you go through hard times, some of the strongest bonds that you may ever have in your life other than marriage and children is those men you serve as a fellow soldier with. When you learn to trust them and they learn to trust you, that's a special bond. And Paul said he's a fellow soldier. I was listening, to, again, on the Christian radio, stories of great Christian. They were talking about Sergeant York. and He had the conviction not to kill someone, but... You know, he was thinking to go to war was like murder, and they were explaining from the Scripture, no, even in the Old Testament there was war and there was killing. It's wrong to go out and kill someone to get their gain. It's not wrong to protect your nation. But they told Sergeant York, you can't, before he's a sergeant, you can't go to war and these men not trust you that you will do your job as a soldier. And he thought about that that I can't go over there and uh, hold up a rifle and say bang, bang, bang and not do anything to protect. They're trusting me. And uh, that's the kind of bond that, that he, re and boy, what a, what a soldier he became and was. And a Christian wanted that, a great example as a Christian. But Paul says, this man has stood with me. And uh, hey, there may be somebody going through a tough time and you know what they may need? They may, may need a fellow soldier, lady or man somebody to stand with him. And that's the way Epaphroditus was. But he also had a crisis. Let's go a little further down. Verse 26, For he longed after you all and was full of heaviness because that you had heard that he had been sick. His, uh, his crisis was not, first of all, that he was sick. His crisis was that they heard about him being sick. And so because they were concerned for him, it says that he was full of heaviness because they were full of heaviness about him. He was not as concerned for himself as he was for them. I think, you know, as a parent, 
sometimes, you know, maybe you've had a checkup or something that was kind of uncertain, you know, is this really bad news? And you didn't want to tell your children yet because you didn't want them to be upset. And this is the way Epaphroditus was thinking about his illness. But he also did have a crisis in body. Notice verse 27, for indeed he was sick, nigh, near, almost unto death. Now notice these next words. But God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. There's a lot we can say in that. Number one, he was a good Christian man, but he was sick nigh unto death. I don't know where all the faith healers were in that day, do you? I don't know where all the, the uh, uh, what is it, gab it and grab it, name it and claim it, where, uh, you know, you, you're not supposed to be sick if you're sick. You know, you're in sin. I don't think Epaphroditus was backslidden, but he was sick. We can be spiritual and be sick. But another thing to notice, it says, but God had mercy on him. Now that to me struck me interesting. But God had mercy on him. Do you know what that tells me? Number one, I'll put it in the negative uh, uh, thoughts first. Number one, that never think that someone is too far sick, but what God cannot show mercy and heal them. Number two, don't ever think that it's guaranteed. Now think about that. But God had mercy on him. But God may have decided to take him home. Isn't that the way it works? And you know, many of us have been healed many, many times. We don't know how many times, <clears throat> even other things, like we don't know how many times we've gone down a two-lane road and we passed somebody during the night and they were just about to blink off and maybe God woke them up and they didn't go in your lane and you didn't die. You know, we, we don't know how many times God's had mercy on us. But, you know, why doesn't God always heal us? Because it is appointed unto man once to die. And that, that appointment for some is in their 40s. And I guess it's kind of like, you know, when our work on earth is done, it, as Paul said, he didn't say it now, but in 2 Timothy he said, you know, I've run my race and I'm ready to go. But I think it's interesting. And so <clears throat> never think that anyone is too sick that God can't have mercy, but also don't think that God has to have mercy. He knows what he's doing. Amen. You know, it's like the cook in the kitchen. She knows how much heat to put on she knows when to back off the heat that's a good cook and the lord knows what he's doing as well so a crisis in his body but god had mercy upon him <clears throat> and i think that's a good lesson for us to learn but another thing in that paul said in verse 27 lest i should have sorrow upon sorrow but aren't we told we shouldn't have sorrow when someone dies no i don't think we're told we shouldn't have sorrow when someone dies i think we should say let us sorrow not as others that have no hope. You know, if someone close to you dies, that it's okay to have sorrow. You know, Paul would have had sorrow upon sorrow if Epaphroditus had died. I think that's interesting. Sorrow is something that, you know, when you lose something, you feel something. Amen? Somebody special to you, you're not going to be the same the next day when they're not there on their pillow. But we're not to be engulfed in sorrow. Sorrow needs to be worked through. You know, hey, do you have any aches and pains? Do you try to work them out? I've got a hip every once in a while that says, you're 72. But I, I do some stretches and I try to work it out and I try to get that thing and it's doing pretty good, thank the Lord. Now, Lord, don't, don't do anything to it. Just keep it going the way it is. But it's like sorrow. Some things hurt, but we're to work try to work through it and keep walking with the Lord. And then so Paul says, let's commend men like Epaphroditus. Verse 28, I sent him therefore the more carefully that when you see him again, you may rejoice and that I may be the less sorrowful. Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness and hold such in reputation. In other words, value what this man has done for you. Because for the work of Christ, he was nigh, almost nigh unto death, not, regard, not regarding his life 
to supply your lack of service toward me. So he was doing what they couldn't do. He did, he was like Timothy. He said, I'll go, I'll go. Now, I don't think anyone ought to be careless with their health, and I don't think God teaches that. But he was putting the things of the Lord. In other words, he realized there was danger. You're on one of these old sailing vessels, man. You may go through a storm and you may be soaked for days. And, you know, there's a danger of pneumonia and things like that. And he was saying, well, I'll just have to trust the Lord. So he, as it says, not caring, not regarding his life. Well, let's conclude. Imagine Paul sitting in that prison and all these uncertainties and the trials and sick people around him, and maybe sometimes he's see, sick as well. And what do you do? Well, some verses that, that I see. And by the way, sometimes God shows a miracle for mercy. Sometimes he shows medicine. It's interesting. You can, take, you can have a pain over here and take an aspirin, well, take a Tylenol, and it'll help it. I don't know how, but you can have a pain down here and take a Tylenol, and it may help it. You know why that is? Because God made us that way. He could have made us where nothing would help us, but that's his mercy too. But anyway, uh, there's a lot of times, if you read through these times, you'd see again and again where Paul says, verse 23, I hope. He's saying, uh, I trust, in verse 19, I trust, I hope. He says that several times. And I think that's the, that's the secret of uh, living and being a happy Christian and having some gladness, treat people right, Appreciate people and what they do. Be a helper. Don't put ourselves in our own things all the time before the Lord's, okay? Good. Dear Lord, we thank you for trying to teach us, and we do pray that we can be more like the Lord Jesus that didn't consider himself having to be served. He wanted to serve. And we do pray that we can do that. Help us to know our part, not to get into somebody else's business, but to know what our part is and to do it. And thank you for these loving people. I, I certainly commend them. I'm not fussing with anyone. I'm just teaching the lesson. I pray your blessing on these people that many, many years have they served in your church. In Jesus' name, amen.